Praise God. Well, here we are, Thursday, uh, the 23rd of July. It's a beautiful day in the uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's good to be with everyone again. We appreciate everyone that's listening in, and um, we've been praying for our brother Painter's mother. Uh, she's been in the hospital and she's been uh, unresponsive and so I don't know if she's uh, we can't regain conscious or not but everyone does need to pray for her and uh, and brother Lyle and which is brother <clears throat> Sonny Daniels grandson in Poto Oklahoma he's been in the hospital and actually been on the ventilator but I believe that they've maybe taken him off of it now but I'm sure he still would appreciate all of our prayers. God would help him get a complete recovery here. Um, <clears throat> Brother uh, Shelby Weaver, he needs continued uh, needs uh, needs our prayers. He's been in the hospital. He had pneumonia and then he wound up in the hospital and then back out of the hospital and back in and actually tested positive for coronavirus. So. Um, he's been, he's really been sick and we need to continue to pray for him. I, I don't think he's recovered yet, but, uh, and then sister, um, Mac Fee's sister passed away last week and they buried her this past Monday and so we need to continue to pray for that family. Anyway, I just want to welcome everyone and tell you I'm very grateful that you're here. <clears throat> I might say something tonight about uh, about the order of God. Young young ministers need to be uh, instructed on God's order and how it works, and, and um, uh, <clears throat> there's been some uh, over the last few years. There's been some mention of of camps in the body, and I, I might address that. Um, <clears throat> and I know that you know Brother Linegar uh, gave us a, a message on the word camp in English I know some of the Dominicans are listening but in English camp being spelled K -A -E, I mean C-A-M-P um, <clears throat> and he, he said camp is for the word uh, conversation you know we have to our, we're responsible for our conversation and then A for the word attitude you know our conversation is not it's not just exactly what we say with our tongue and our mouth but our life it bespeaks of uh, our character our our doings uh how we communicate, uh, how we communicate the gospel, the righteousness of the gospel. Um, and then A is for attitude, what our attitude is. Uh, I'm a pilot, Brother Linegar was a pilot also, uh, but I was an instrument pilot. Uh, I still am an instrument pilot, but I haven't been flying of late. I'm, I think I've about reached the age that it's not wise for me to fly alone, for sure. Um, it, and that is in, by instruments in the suit. And there's a gauge inside the airplane that's called the attitude gauge. It's the attitude indicator. And that, that attitude indicator tells you it has an artificial horizon across the middle of it and then, of course, if you turn to the left, well, that attitude will turn like that. If you turn to the right, it'll turn that way. If you uh, go down 
it will drop below that center line showing that you're going below level. You're, you're heading downward. If it's above the line, you're climbing and are, are below, of course, descending. And so it's an important thing if you're flying an airplane to know what your attitude is, to know, in other words, if you're in the clouds and you can't see, then you need to watch that attitude, attitude indicator. Uh, of course, there's other indicators. Number one, your speed. Your speed indicator, if you're going down, is going to be climbing, going faster, faster, faster. If you're going up, it's going to be going slower, slower, slower. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, you have an altitude uh, indicator that shows your altitude. Your altitude will be going higher, higher, higher. I, I'll tell you a little story. When I was a very young pilot, just learned how to fly, and... Uh, I, we lived in Winters, Texas. And we flew to see my brother in Kerrville, Texas, which is in the mountain. It's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's in the hill country. That's what they call it, the hill country. It's really not mountains, but it's hills. And uh, <clears throat> we flew there, of course, in the daytime. I had flown at night. I had trained at night. But I had never flown where it was pitch dark and no moon and no stars. And we, of course, I didn't check that before I went. And I intended to go home before it got dark, but we got tied up, you know, visiting and whatsoever. And so it was late when we left, and so it was almost dark when we took off. And we headed back across the hill country, back to uh, winters, which which was less than an hour flight, about 40, 45 minutes. But we no longer got took off that it, it darkness set in. And there was not a star in the sky. There was not a moon. There was no moon in the sky. It was pitch dark. And at that time, I wasn't an a instrument pilot. Uh, of course, you get some training as a private pilot of how that works. And, uh, of course, they teach you that there is such a thing as pilot's vertigo, which you can be flying straight, but you may feel like you're just going straight down. Uh, or you may feel like that you're, you know, turning to the right when you're actually going level. You have to pay attention and trust your, your gauges. You cannot trust your feelings. You know, it's somewhat that way in serving God. You cannot trust the feelings, your feelings. You have to trust the Word of God. You have to have confidence in God. You have to trust what the Word of God has told you. And you cannot, you cannot go by feelings all the time, especially feelings of the flesh. Anyway, my wife and I were flying along, and it was, I'm telling you, it was pitch dark. And of course, I was a young pilot. My wife had only been with me a few times in the plane. It was just me and her. And uh, I didn't say anything to her. But, I mean, this was just like you were shut up in a closet, pitch dark, with a roaring engine of an airplane. And I'm looking at the dash. Well, the dash says you're flying level. Your altitude, you know, my altitude says, okay, you're at, you're at 5,000 feet. And <clears throat> it says you're, you're level and you're, you're not climbing. You're not, and you're, you're, you're not descending. Your speed is maintaining the same identical speed. So everything's, you know, everything's copacetic. The only problem is, in a little while, I started feeling like I was just going straight down, like mm, just right bearing right down toward the earth. There was no lights on the ground. I couldn't see anything. There was not a light, a house, or nothing over the area we were flying. There's no lights in the sky, no lights on the ground. It was totally pitch dark. Well, I mean, I knew eventually I'm going to come into a populated area and see some lights on the ground, but, but you can't imagine how five minutes seems like 
you know, three hours <laughs> flying like that. Anyway, we're flying along and, I, and I'm feeling like I'm going down. So I start climbing. I start, I keep, I keep pulling back on the yoke because I, I just feel like I'm going down. I got to go up. And when I would, when I would go up, my altitude said, you're climbing. My speed slowed down. My altimeter said, you're, you know, you were at 5,000, you're at five, now you're 5,200, now you're 5,400, now you're 5,600. Now finally I got up to 6,000. And of course, uh, you're the, depending on the direction you're flying, you're supposed to be flying odd thousand feet or even thousand feet. So I needed to go to 7,000 or back down to 5,000. Well, there's no way I could go back to 5,000 because I felt like I was going straight down. So I kept climbing, finally went up to 7,000. Tried to hold it there, but I finally went up, kept going up, up, up. Oh, I was just suffering with this. You know, I was, I was trying to just trust my gauges, get my gauges back to where I'm flying level, my altimeter's straight, I'm at the right altitude, my speed is, is uh, uh, stationary, and uh, there's also a artificial horizon that shows that you're up and down or moving on the artificial horizon. So there's several gauges that, you know, back up one another. Finally, I took all of it I could take. Uh, I looked over at my wife and I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm fine. I said, <laughs> I said, does it feel like to you that we're going up or down? And she said, you don't know if we're going up or down. <laughs> I mean, she almost went hysterical. And I said, oh, no, I know. I just wondered how it felt, <laughs> how it felt to you. And, uh, but then I began to tell her, I began to show her on the gauges how I knew. And that helped me to begin to talk about the gauges, talk about our attitude and where we was in the sky. And finally, a little white light showed up on the ground. And then a little while, another one showed up. It wasn't too long. We were, we were at our home airport. The only problem is we were about 5,000 feet above, above the airport. I had to do quite a bit of circling to get down, down, down to get in a landing pattern because I was way too high. Anyway, <clears throat> I just told you that little story to tell you that your, your, your attitude, you have to govern your attitude by the word of God and by your faith in God. Many times, uh, a lot of times problems, there's problems in your life. And there, we need, our attitudes need to be uh, governed by the word of God and by our faith in God. <clears throat> Uh, I was just going over this little word camp, C-A-M-P. Uh, conversation, attitude, then the M is for motive, what our motive is. You know, if if we have a self-righteous motive or if we're a selfish or covetous, you know, if, if our motive is because we're, we're maybe trying to be somebody or, or uh, cause others to believe that we're something or someone that we're not deceitfulness um, and so to have a pure motive to be pure you know I'm not trying to be more than what I am Paul said that in, in his letter to the Corinthians he said I'm not trying to st stretch myself above my measure he realized that he had a measure um in the in Ephesians the fourth chapter, let me say something about that. <clears throat> in the sixth, I'm gonna read the sixth and seventh verse of Ephesians four. It says, There's one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. See, every one of us have grace, but it's according to the measure. In other words, it depends on what's been measured to you. In other words, uh, God's going to give you uh, 
a certain amount of information, a certain amount of understanding, but you have to grow and develop in that, and that's what measure you've received. And, and of course, the measure comes from the ministry. God gives the ministry uh, a measure of grace, and they give it out to the people. And so, uh, so we all our our motives. You know, we have we have to learn and develop the right motive, the pure motive of being. I've often said, you know, to learn how to be ourselves, learn how to know who we are, whether or not we're on a false foundation or we're, and, and you also are not to get below your foundation. You're not to get, uh, you know, below where God is asking you to live uh, on the level that he's de developed or directed you in. Sister Amy Rattler is asking us to pray also for Sister Brenda Rattler. She's, she's, uh, she suffers continually in, in her respiratory problems and she needs to stay on our, our prayer, prayer list. Also, Sister Amy's been had to go to the hospital this past week and, and uh, you know, she's, she's, she's had some health issues so we need to keep her on a prayer list too. Anyway, then motive, and then P in camp, the word camp, the P stands for priorities what our priorities are. You can get your priorities wrong. You can get, you can get uh, your priorities out of balance. You can prioritize temporal things and not have a priority on spiritual things where you ought to have. Now, you have natural responsibilities, so you have to have a priority to meet the responsibility of, your, uh, of, your, of the natural things that are in your life. At the same time, you shouldn't put that up above. You have to learn how to get a balance of having my spiritual priorities where they ought to be. That I keep God on my front burner. I keep the Lord, the Lord's will, the, the Word of God, my spiritual walk as a priority uh, in life. It's a responsibility to the Lord as His child for me to prioritize to uh, learn, continue to learn of Him, develop in Him, uh, in the in my spiritual walk. So I just thought I would mention that because I was mentioning this word camp, uh, because there's been some uh, mention of of camps in the body of Christ, and uh, you know I I believe that uh, there are. I, camps are necessary. They're biblical. There is there is biblical righteous camps, which has to do with the order of God. And then there are some camps that are not righteous, and they're they're against the things of God. So we have to have a balance and understanding. You know, if you go back to the Old Testament, <clears throat> there were there were twelve tribes of Israel, and the temple of God had had four encampments around the temple. Actually, there were, there were five, but, but the, around the outside of the, of the temple, there were the, and there was one tribe or one camp who was in charge of each one of those four encampments. The, the tribe of Judah was in charge of the encampment on the east side. Uh, the, 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 uh, let me try to remember. It's in Numbers, the fourth chapter. Um, uh, Reuben was over one of the encampments. And then, uh, let's turn to Numbers 4. We'll take us a few seconds to look at it because I'm not getting it in my mind right now. Uh, I just want you to know, and you might say, well, that was in the Old Testament. Well, uh, you know, the New Testament is just a it's the Old Testament revealed and the New Test Old Testament's the New Testament concealed. So it's just one book. <clears throat> uh, is it in the, it may be in the second, yeah, it's in the second chapter of uh, Numbers. So you can read it, <clears throat> but 
God did this, had Moses put these encampments around the, around the tabernacle. As I said, Judah was on the east side and uh, it, it was the ruling camp over uh, Issachar and Zebulun. But then on the uh, south side of the, of the tabernacle, Reuben, uh, his ensign or flag was that of a man in fact, I think these, I think you could use these as the four beasts around the throne in the book of Revelations, uh, Judah being uh, the lion and uh, Reuben being the man. And then on the west side was Ephraim and that was the calf or the ox was his flag. Uh, and uh, that's in Deuteronomy 33 that tells you that. But then... Uh, on the north side was Dan, and that his ensign was an eagle. And uh, so those were the four encampments. Dan was over Asher and Naphtali. Uh, Ephraim was over Manasseh and Benjamin. Reuben was over Simeon and Gad. Judah, I said, was over Issachar and Zebulun. But it actually goes back further than that because this has to do with order. It has to do with order. See, See, that, that encampment, uh, Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan had a responsibility over those tribes and those encampments of those three tribes on all four sides of the tabernacle. Their responsibility, they were the head of it. They, let, they, they, were, they had to watch over the camp. They were the leading uh, in, uh, encampment or leading tribe of the encampment on each side. But we're talking about God's order. The, the, the Levitical priesthood was on the inside of that uh, before the, the tabernacle. But those 12 tribes were protectors around the, the tabernacle and they were encamped. That, that kept the tabernacle protected it also kept all those tribes were protecting and guarding the camp. And so there's responsibilities of leadership there. But if you go back into God's, uh, uh, God's order, it, it even goes all the way back to a family. A, every family is a camp. Every, every man is in charge of his camp. He's in charge of his wife and his children. Uh, you could even say that the wife has a camp because it's delegated to her to be over the children. Uh, and so, you know, even as a pastor, see, uh, as a, as a uh, but well, before I talk about pastors, let me just get back on families a minute. You see, if a, if a man has children, and, uh, and those children in his family, uh, if those children in that family do not honor the father, they're not obedient, and they're rebellious, that father is not going to put any responsibility on them, neither is he going to put his favor on them. But if he's got, let's say, a faithful son, and that son works with him and is obedient and faithful to him and carries out his orders, and is always there to work with him and support him, then who do you think that father's going to, going to give responsibility? Who is he going to look to to help him and support him in what he's trying to do in, in building his family and, and the land that they have and the house that they have and the, the watch over the children that they have? He's going to use the most faithful the most obedient in his family. That's, it's not that a man would love a child necessarily more than another. However, I do think that you can have a greater love for some of your offspring because some offspring are not worthy of your love. You may love them, but you may not like them. You may not like their attitude, their, their, their conversation, their attitude, their motive their priorities in life. Even though you may teach them if they rebel against you, 
you're not going to be able to build anything in your family with them. That's part of the natural order of God. It's that way in the church. See, a church, a pastor's over a church, and that is a camp. That's his camp. He's got a responsibility to it. And uh, uh, he should have, and, and he's got families in these churches. Now, he should not violate the camps of those families. He shouldn't violate the men. Those men, he needs to work with men and help those men to know how to rule over their own household. To, you know, that, that's a requirement of men, uh, bishops or elders or uh, deacons, they're to rule their own household. They're to have their children to be in, in uh, obedience to them and have be in submission. That's the marks of a leader to see to it that he has enough discipline in his camp. But uh, a man shouldn't violate other men in his church. He should work with the men. He shouldn't go directly to the children or directly to the wives without talking to the man about it and having letting the man do the correcting. Uh, you, you could violate camps right inside your camp. <laughs> so to speak, see, because it's, it, it is authority over an, a greater encampment of camps. And so it's the same way, you know, the world has, the world of business have, has robbed God's order. They, they wouldn't have any order if they hadn't followed God's order to some extent. You know, if you're working on a job and and you want to succeed in that job, then you, you better know who your supervisor is, who is your boss. See, like, like the Bible tells us, Jesus is the head of the body. Well, he's the head of the body the way a CEO is the head of a company. So you may work for a company, you may not deal directly with that CEO, but there's delegated authority down the line and somebody's your boss that's got to answer to somebody who finally answers to the CEO. And Jesus is the head of every man in that way. However, we do he is our personal Lord and Savior, so everyone has the right to go directly to the Lord, but if you want the Lord to deal with your case, he's probably going to go through delegated authority to some extent. He's probably going to give your pastor messages that is going to deal with different situations in the church and help the families and individual lives. God does that through anointed, the anointed word of God, teaching the principles that need to be taught, principles of righteousness in life. And, and who do you think your boss is going to elevate or give any responsibility to or elevate possibly in pay, possibly in position. If it, it's, you can be assured it's going to be somebody he can trust, somebody that's faithful to him, someone that's loyal to him, someone that can stand and take his correction, some, his instruction, someone who's flexible enough that's going to be a part of that man's administration. See, the apostle Paul, he's called the, the chief apostle to the Gentiles. And that man is, he is chief uh, over his administration. It's in, where is that in the second, in the second, in second Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I'll read it to you. It says, um, uh, the fourth verse says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are diversities of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to everyone to profit with all. So there, there are different administrations. You know, administration is a, 
ongoing work working effective group led by a responsible leader. And so uh, Paul, he had an administration being the chief apostle over the Gentiles. Peter was called chief apostle of the Jews. So those are, those are camps. See, Peter didn't violate Paul by going into his area. Paul didn't violate Peter. He said in, uh, in, in Romans 15, I believe it is, uh, I believe it's the 15th chapter of Romans. Let's see if I can get that for you real quick. Um, in the 20th verse, it says, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom it was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard sh shall understand. Paul didn't want to build on another man's foundation and violate that man's camp. I'm using that word because it's been used for a few years and I just, I wanted to elaborate on a little bit and both sides of it. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, this equipment that I'm, I'm speaking of, excuse my dogs, uh, but it definitely has to do, it's territorial. Paul had Paul had a territory. All the apostles worked in different territories. Now, it's easy when you read the New Testament to see that when the apostle Paul died, Peter stepped in and began to help the works of Paul. And when Peter died, John, the apostle John, stepped in and helped begin to help the Gentile work. Of course, the Jews, you know, the church began to fall away and he's left dealing with the Gentile church there in the very end as the church fell away. But of course, he was there and, and you know, he was one of the 12 apostles. So he saw the whole thing from the from both sides of, of, the, of, of all the camp. Now, it's just one body. See, Israel was just one nation. It was just one group of people. It didn't start out as a nation, but... It was one family of people, Israel, which was the 12 sons of Jacob, which made up 12 tribes as it grew and developed, and God did that. And, but it was just one Israel. It was just one nation of people. But it was made up of different tribes and different encampments that, and each, by the way, each tribe had their own judgment seat. They had their own... Uh, they had rulers of fifties, rulers of hundreds, rulers of thousands. They had elders in every tribe that judged every case that uh, that came up in that tribe. They handled their own judgment. If they couldn't handle it, then they'd take it to Moses. But, uh, and I think it could be taught. To, taken before the chief elders that made up all tw the elders of uh, elder of every tribe, if need be, but every tribe handled their own cases as much as they could handle it by the law. They didn't they didn't take cases outside of that. Neither did anybody go in there and violate that tribe, unless they were asked to uh, be consulted and counseled with to help get a judgment that was maybe needed, needful, that was higher. It was, you know, uh, that, that they needed the whole, maybe the whole of Israel to concur on the judgment because it may have been a serious uh, situation that, that wasn't common just to be judged, but it may have taken Moses, it may have taken, you know, greater elders, you know, some 50, rulers over 50s, they could judge, if they could judge it, they didn't have to take it above them to rulers over hundreds or rulers over a thousand. 
That's part of God's order. It's still God's order today. We're not made up of 12 tribes, but we are made up of churches. And men are over churches, you know, and, and it is territorial. You shouldn't go in another man's territory, another man's area, without honoring that man, considering that man, working with that man. If you're in an area and you can't work with a man that's in that area, you ought to get out of that area and work somewhere would it be righteous to work, work and not work against a man that's already established and, and, and uh, preaching in a certain area. You know, I think if, you know, like all the time, there's people that like, for example, uh, if I, let's say that I go to, I don't know, let's just, let's just pick someone. Let's just say I go to Houston, Texas. And I've got friends. I, I was actually, I, grew, I, I graduated from Deer Park, Texas. My wife graduated from Houston, uh, South Houston, Texas High School. We were in the Houston area as children, teenagers, and adults. Uh, uh, of course, we, we, we uh, were removed from those areas just by situations of life. And you know, I was in the Army and wound up in San Antonio, Texas, and we were in San Antonio several years and, and so forth. But anyway, God's moved us around. Uh, and maybe when the Lord didn't move us, we moved around ourselves. But uh, but let's just say that I had a friend in Houston, Texas. I do have, I mean, I only got friends. I've got family down in that area. So let's see that I met somebody that was interested in the body of Christ and I went down there, visited with them, you know, shared this message with them. And, and they began to receive it and accept it and they wanted to know more about it. See, that doesn't give me a right to think that I need to go down there and have a work outside of the Houston church or, Houston, or the Texas churches that may have churches right in the same locale or nearby. No, my job would be to go to Brother Brown or Brother Wright now or other men, uh, maybe pastors that might be uh, closer to that area and tell them I've got someone that I want you to meet. I would like for this person to know you. I'd like for them to be able to come to your church. See, they live there. There's a ready going church there for them that there's an order there for them if I went in there and started trying to do something and build, I would be actually creating division against the church in that area or the administration in that area. It's just, it's just simple order. But there are so many people that violate the order because they think, because I know this person that gives me a right to cross, to go across lines. It's nothing wrong with going across lines with a right attitude, a right motive, a right priority, and you're more than willing to give this, whoever's in authority in that area to hand that over to them. Think about, you know, Philip went down into Samaria. He worked many miracles, done many healings. I mean, that it was vibrant what was taking place there. Most men today, if they went there, they'd think, my God, I'm the apostle of Samaria. What did he do? He knew he wasn't an apostle. He called for Peter and John and said, hey, God is doing something in Samaria. You apostles need to come down here. He didn't even teach them about the Holy Ghost. He just, the spirit of God worked in him. And he was so happy to leave there after John, Peter and John got there and just go on his way. And he met up with a guy, a eunuch in a chariot, reading the Bible, the book of Isaiah. And he was happy just to crawl on that chariot with that guy and say, do you know what you're reading? He said, no, how am I going to understand if somebody don't explain me? And he began to explain Jesus to that man and they found a body of water and he baptized him right there. But see, 
he wasn't thinking that Samaria was his. He was more than glad to turn out over to the apostles, let them go over there and establish something under their administration because there was an apostolic work back then. We're still restoring the church today and we're not operating exactly the same, but we will in a restored church, I believe with my whole heart, we'll have to have an apostolic ministry. Men who are apostles. I've often said today that uh, uh, I, I, uh, I have said today that um, um, you know, that, that uh, men ought to honor, you know, these, these men that are proven leaders. They, you know, and listen, let me, let me just say this to you. You're never going to find a man that you think is perfect. You're not going to find a man that's without fault. What you do need to realize is, is that you'll find men God has set in place. And that should be an obvious thing if they really have a vibrant work, if they really are, are established and proven themselves over years, then you ought, to, you ought to honor that man. You ought to recognize that man. You ought to realize that this man may not, I may not be able to agree with him on everything. Let me tell you what I did when I came to this body. I realized that, hey, these men have so much more than I have that I'm willing to give up what I've got to get what they've got. I, it'd be up. It would be, I would come way ahead on the trade. What I found out was I didn't have to give up anything that I had that was really, you know, it was really right. I really had something. Because most men don't try to take things away from you, especially if they're reasonable or, you know, uh, but they're willing to share what they do have. Now, when you start trying to, you know, rise up on their level and try to, you know, correct them, you may be, you may be getting out of your place. But getting back to the order of God, what I was going to say was men in these local churches, who do you think those, those pastors are going to use if they're not men? You know, I heard a man, a great man in this body one time say this. He said, I was accused of being a yes man to my pastor, and his pastor was a great leader in this body. He said, I didn't deny it. He needed a, he needed a yes man. He needed a faithful man. He needed a loyal man. He needed a man that would support him. He needed a man that was, he was absolutely sold on the idea of working with that man. He said, what's wrong with that? Again, there are camps. There's, I mean, there's administrations. I, I can, you can tear it down into families inside a church. A church or a man that's over more churches. Those are camps. He has an administration that he works over. Then, you know, there are leaders in the body. Uh, what I was going to say earlier is I, I, I have said that in the body of Christ, the general meetings and the minister's meetings we've had is the glue that has held us together these years while the church is being restored. See, what held the early church together were apostles, men with the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God that were together those apostles were together, even though, you know, they may have hit a bump once in a while. You know, remember Peter was rebuked by the apostle Paul. Peter had a higher position than Paul did, certainly at the time. But T Peter took the rebuke. He took it. He realized it was from God. They worked it out. Uh, those men, they, those men had fear of God and fear of one another are violating one another. And I'm sure they had fear of violating uh, 
other ministers of the fivefold ministry as well as saints. I can tell you at my age and the years of experience I have, I fear, I fear the saints of God. And who I fear the most are, are people that I know are gonna obey me when I give them counsel or instruction. People who do not argue, people who support me, people who are faithful. Who do you think I'm gonna elevate if it's not men that I trust men that have showed their faithfulness, men that I haven't had to wrangle with, you know, to get them to agree with me, whether they agreed or not. At least they had enough wisdom to realize that I'm not going to get anywhere trying to wrestle with this man of God that's over me in the Lord. Now, at the same time, I think there's a way to appeal. Now, I've said quite a bit here about order and and camps are different responsibilities. Now, there is another camp that's not righteous, and that's men that, that work against order, men that, um, and, and normally, you know, you'll get it. I, I don't know if there's a church without it. <laughs> it's part of it. It's part of, you know, growing, developing. It's part of leaders learning how to deal with issues, situations, Sometimes people that are somewhat unruly can become a very faithful, loyal, obedient uh, child of God and, and a worker together with the ministry of that, of that local assembly or, or whatever he's over in the Lord. But there are people that, you know, their attitude is wrong. They're, they're not able to stay in balance. They're not able to stay, you know, keep climbing up. Or they may be constantly going down. They, they're, they're, uh, they're, not, they're going by their feelings. They're going by what they think maybe is taking place when it may not be taking place at all. I've been, I've been called a liar <laughs> when I simply said something and then I realized later I, I did say, I, I mean, I simply said I didn't say something when maybe the next day I realized I did do that. I forgot I did that. And I just had to admit it. But I didn't lie intentionally. I just, I didn't think I did it. You know, I am getting a little older. I'm not, my mind's not as sharp as I used to be. And, and of course, you can say, oh, you remember. Well, I can, I can just tell you right now, I do not deliberately lie. I'm beyond that. If I tell you something and I have to correct it later, it's because I don't remember it or, um, you know, it, I mean, there's certain things, I got a lot, I got a lot in my mind, a lot going on. And so sometimes I don't remember exactly, did I do that or not? Or was I just thinking I did it? Or was I thinking I needed to do it and didn't do it? But sometimes people think you lie because you may, or you may say you're going to do something, then you forget to do it. You don't do it. So you, it looks like that you deceitfully said you was going to do something that you didn't do. Uh, anyway, there are other, there are other uh, camps. I'll just mention that. You know, now I'm not thinking of any one camp right now. I'm th what I am thinking about is the fact that this topic of camps has been mentioned now for many years. And, you know, and I've, I've thought at times when man would mention it and talk about it, I think, what is he talking about? What is he really referring to? But I know I've, I've evaluated and, and considered it for some time. I guess I should have just at one point asked the question. But I realize, you know, I know the man well enough uh, and different ones that have mentioned it that I realize they're talking about, you know, normally when one man gets in a bad attitude or gets in a, a frame of mind where he's against the leadership that he's under, he'll normally justify himself and begin to go around talking to, I'll tell you who he talks to, he talks to weaker people. He's not going to talk to somebody that's going to shut him down right away and say, hey, I'm not going to receive an accusation against an elder 
we're not going to gossip like you're doing. If they know I'm not going to get anywhere, they won't deal with that person. But what they'll do is they'll go around and find somebody weak in an assembly or, and they'll begin to talk to them. And they'll bring up one side of a story and make, make the leader look bad. In a little while, they'll find somebody that maybe they kind of had some ideas about the leader that they didn't understand, that they didn't like either. Before long, the, that guy's got somebody to join in with him. That's a, that's a work of iniquity, and that can become a camp. You can finally get a little group, a little encampment that's building against the righteousness of the established order of God. And I know that's what these brethren, I'm talking about the ministry dealing with this. But I, what I've been thinking about is that we don't want to do away with camps. We just don't want the, right, the wrong kind of camps. But I'm going to tell you something. As long as there's flesh in the body of Christ, we will have the wrong kind of camps. Jesus said it. He said, Heresy must come, but woe be unto him by whom it comes. It's going to happen. People are going to rise up against the chosen men of God. Uh, and they're going to suffer for it. I've watched it now for well over 40 years. I've never seen anybody rise up against order, against men that are proven men. Even if the man was wrong, you still won't be able to survive rising up against him. God's the only one that will take him out are the men of God if he does something severe enough that he'd need to be taken out of that position. But somebody much on a much lower level than he rise up against him, they will commit suicide, spiritual suicide or, or suicide in the family of God because they're going to hurt themselves. And uh, But, you know, but let me say this, the ministry is patient and it's got a lot of grace. And so a lot of times men work and they may work wrong and may build an encampment wrong. But men of God want everyone to be saved that can be saved. And so they tolerate, they tolerate that. And they, they work with it. And they try to save everything that can be saved and forgive everything that can be forgiven. Now they may get a wisdom that they finally realize that I can't use that that person. That person's too corrupt, or that person's got too many problems that I'm going to have to deal with. It's going to continually tear down and hurt the work of God, and I just can't help that person. That person just it's just trouble. You know, they'll do good for a while and more here's trouble. You know, and, and so you finally have to realize that I can, that person is hurtful to, to the work of God and I can't work with them. You know, and sometimes you just have to turn someone over to Satan. Like Paul did in 1 Corinthians 5 where he turned the man that had his father's wife, he turned him over to Satan that, for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved. Sometimes you have to let Satan, that word Satan means adversary. Sometimes you just have to let the adversary of sin, that, that adverse against the work of God or the order of God, you've got to turn that over and just let somebody, let it work detrimental to them and get that out of the the work of God so that the spirit of Christ of righteousness can be saved and that spirit is not going to continue to tear down the things of God. Notice this. After Paul turned that man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, later that man humbled himself, repented, and Paul reached back and brought him back in. So not everyone, not everyone that fails in the way of God. See, sometimes it depends on where you come from, what, you, what you've been through, how you've been devastated. I mean, some people, uh, they, they, they imagine things in their mind. Some people don't realize they want something or they may covet something 
that they have no business coveting. They'd be happy or without it. But they're still trying to find themselves because of the hurts they've been through or the, the situations, the experiences that they've suffered under. See, there is a lot of people of God that are victims of situation, circumstances. And so some things we just have to turn over to God. I can tell you this, if you're God's child, if he can save you, he's going to save you. But he may turn you loose. Uh, he may turn you loose and let you go for a time for the destruction of the flesh. He may let you see that what you're doing is not going to, you're not going to survive under that, not spiritually, not in spiritual things. And so God, you know, God may, and a lot of times people, they, they keep thinking, you know, here's a little thing that's happening to me. And that's just a natural thing. Here's another thing happening to me. You know, here recently, I, I, I was dealing with a man and uh, he was he was fairly young in the Lord, and I told him I, I gave him some counsel, and I told him not to do what he was wanting to do. I said, "Don't do that. God don't want you to do that. That's not wisdom." He disobeyed me and did it. Well, he ran into all kinds of trouble. He, all kinds of trouble. He finally, you know got back, got his feet back on the ground and decided he was going to do something else. But all this time he's against me because he didn't want to obey. He didn't want to do what I said. He wouldn't agree with me. So he decided he was going to use his car to be a mode of, of uh, finance, you know, to make finances uh, using his car. The first or second time he did it, he blew the engine up. He, just one thing after the other happened. I finally asked him, in fact, I, you know, I was trying to help him. Even in all he's done, I still try to help him. I said, have you ever considered that maybe the disobedience that you have took, made a stand? Have you ever considered that God loves you enough that he's dealing with you? And these things that's coming against you is God's correcting hand? You don't think God loves you? He may love you enough that he wants He wants to help you. But he was looking, and many people look at it like it's just a natural thing, just going through something right now. Well, it could be just something that you're going through. But if you're if 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 I was in a derogatory place or in a negative place against the leadership in, in my life of, of the things of God and the body of Christ and different things start happening to me, I'd start asking God about that and start questioning that. You know, we're taught that. In the day of adversity, consider, the Bible tells us. So when things are adverse, you need to consider, you need to think about why. Think about Job. How what he was going through, that he he was looking for the answer from God about what he was going through. Finally, God did talk to him. Finally, God did correct him of some things. But God also blessed him because God didn't just do to Job what happened to him just for punishment of Job's wrongdoings. He did it to show that there was a man of God that would serve me no matter what. No matter who came against him, he would serve me. And in all that he went through, he continued to seek God until he got an answer from God. And God healed him of his problems, restored the things that were taken from him. And he died knowing that he would get a great resurrection. Anyway, I just thought I would mention some of these things about the order of God. Um, you know, I don't want us to throw camps away, and we might not already use that word, but uh, you could call them families. You could call them, you know, elements. I don't think there's anything wrong with calling them camps. There's, they're, the body of Christ is made up of camps, encampments, 
of administrations of men of God that are watching over the people of God in those camps or families, little camps, that those fathers, those righteous men are looking over their family or their little camps. They shouldn't be violated. Neither should the order of God in, on any level. But there are, there are other camps that are wrong, they're not righteous. And those camps ought to be dealt with and they should be judged. Maybe they should be judged, but with a lot of patience, a lot of tenderness, a lot of desire to save. At the same time, sometimes you can't deal with a camp that is devastating to your encampment. And so sometimes you have to, you, you can't use that camp. You can't let it operate inside of your administration. So we just have to, you know, we hope that it never comes to that. We hope that the people of God will have peace and work together. And for the most part, we do. For the most part, we have a great, this is a great body of people with a great message and a great understanding of the message of God and the coming of Jesus Christ. We're living in a wonderful time. Uh, we may be going through things and we'll go through other things after this subsides. But we're living in a great time when uh, uh, in the end of this world, Jesus is getting things ready for the final harvest of the Gentile world, which will make up the remainder of his bride. It'll be, there will be a restored church. Yes, he will judge false religion. He will judge civil powers. He will, uh, the body of Christ will survive. And God will make up his, his people. Everlasting life is the gift of God that's being handed to his people. Just be faithful. Serve God. Stay in the right spirit. Stay in the right camp. Keep your conversation, your attitude, your motive, and your priority in the right place. And God will bless you. God bless your hearts. Good to be with you again tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to service here in Little Rock with the Little Rock people this weekend. Uh, pray for those that we've mentioned here uh, uh, today. Uh, I'm trying to remember everyone we mentioned, Brother Lyle and uh, Brother Daniel's grandson that's been on ventilator. He's, he is doing better. Yeah, I think he's off the ventilator now and he is conscious again. He had lost conscious somewhat. Brother Painter's mother, Brother, uh, Brother Shelby Weaver, Ray and Susan Weaver, Sister Vichella, her, her sister who passed away recently, week before last, her family to be comforted. Brother Veely's granddaughter, I think her name is Bella Veely. Uh, just, I think she's something like nine years old. Remember Sister Ann McGowan? Uh, she's going to have a have uh, I think a medical procedure pretty soon. But anyway, she ha also needs our prayers. Uh, Brother Roy Durham is going to have a medical procedure coming up. We need to keep him in our prayers, Brother. Of course, I've mentioned Brother Gary Wright and the treatment he's under for the the cancer that he's suffering with, uh, Brother. Uh, Ken Jacoby. I haven't got a report on him in the last few days, but he does have coronavirus. He has been on a ventilator and he's been in very bad condition. Please pray for him. Uh, there is a brother under Brother Bias Ministry in, in uh, I believe it's in Orlando, Florida. Remember him. Pray for Sister Holly Loriano. Uh, she's had some possible exposure to this virus also. So remember all of these things in our prayers. Um, uh, remember the leaders in our nation. Uh, uh, Brother, Brother Daniels, keep Brother Bill Daniels in prayers. He's, he's all suffering with congestive, congestive heart failure. Just, he's just up and down with it. Now, let's just keep him on our prayer list. I'd like to see him live about another 20 years. He's such a precious 
brother and elder in our church. Remember him. Um, the sister, brother Ron Johnson's wife, Beth. Remember her down in Georgia. They're having to stay down there because of their insurance is not covered in Arkansas. So please remember them. Um, again, uh, I love and appreciate all of you saints. And uh, I'll see you Sunday in church. We, again, 930 uh, Continental Style Breakfast um, at 930. Bible study at 10. At 11 o'clock, 10.45, the band goes upstairs for practice and 11.30 regular service. We'll be having a Zoom meeting with the Dominican Republic. Uh, pastors and teacher uh, ministry over there uh, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock our time, which is 7 o'clock their time. And so I'm looking forward to that uh, on a Zoom meeting. Some of you, if you hadn't been on it, well, that that's a there's a Zoom app where you can see Everybody that gets on there, you can see them live. Just little places on your screen. And uh, uh, of course, Brother Emilio Green comes on Zoom with me and interprets uh, uh, interprets my message. Uh, and uh, so I'm looking forward to being with, them, with the pastors and ministers over there tomorrow night. God bless your hearts. Uh, the Lord keep you. I'll see you Sunday morning in Bible study and breakfast. God bless. Have a good night.